Thank you, Nigel. <clears throat> so it's great to be here this morning, and I want to begin by saying thank you to God for the amazing impact that Hope Bristol 218 has had on the city. And it was great just to see some of those pictures and hear some of that testimony already this morning. So it was a, a citywide event that touched brought together so many different churches from all around the city and uh, there were 1,400 volunteers, over 200 projects, community care and outreach, 14 uh, sort of community fun days in, in some of the most urban priority areas of the city. So it had a big impact across the city. It was wonderful to see so many lives touched and great to see um, at least 25 young people becoming Christians for the first time in their lives and not just making that decision to follow Jesus but to see a real sense of calling into discipleship and wanting to commit their lives to making a difference in our world. So that's been wonderful. And uh, what I want to say is that that's not the end of Hope Bristol. In fact, it's just the next step. And there's lots that's been stirring, and I just want to share a little bit for a moment because it'll link in with our theme this morning. So it was maybe just over two years ago now, we felt the Holy Spirit really stirring across the city and uh, felt a stirring of a kind of prophetic word for the city. and felt God was saying that he wanted Bristol to be a city of hope and wanted the church to be taking a lead in building that city of hope. So that was a real challenge, and uh, um, it may be nearly 40 years ago now, we felt a, a similarly experience of God speaking to the life of the city about city of refuge and how that shaped so much in the city over these last 40 years by way of mercy ministries in 125 Project and Crisis Center Ministries and uh, Network Council, all those things began out of that kind of word at that time. And it's been great to see that and the opportunity of being a city of refuge, which now the city officially represent, recognizes as a city of sanctuary. So this is what we're sensing God stirring at this time, is how we as church might be building together Bristol as a city of hope. And just to help us catch that message, I've got a few assistants here tonight, so you're gonna, this morning. So you're going to see this message all over the city. In fact, uh, right the way across the city, there'll be churches who, as from this next month, will be carrying this banner for the next few years. And it'll be saying that uh, we're building... Uh, building Bristol as a city of hope. And it's linking together um, various ventures across the city to be doing that. So look out for these banners and hopefully it'll become something familiar right the way across the city. Thanks very much. It sounds as a, a little one that might especially want mum's attention. <laughs> Great. So um, part of that exercise therefore is an, over these next few years, we're gonna see increasing opportunities for us as church across the city to be seeing transformation and salvation across the city of Bristol. Already lots of those things are happening. We've shared some of those initiatives that are, are really significant, strategic. So on the whole air of uh, food poverty, um, our commitment as churches across the city has been to facilitate that no primary school child in this city will start the day hungry. And now we've developed that whole network of um, breakfast clubs in the most needy areas of the city, and it's churches that are really helping to service all that together with the food bank and other provision that's going on. On housing, it's been great to see the homeless project. Hundreds of folks from across the churches volunteered, so we committed for three months. It's just ended now, end of March, as the warmer weather comes, but for those first three months of the year, to see every night a homeless shelter seven churches in the city centre opening up with all those volunteers. It's been great to see that happening. But we also want to sense long-term commitment to that. So it's not just kind of rough sleepers, but how are we seeing the whole housing issue? So uh, again, it's been great to see some of those amazing initiatives going on housing and folk like Ed Robery here from Woodlands together with Andrew Street and others. So we've just, you may have seen it on the headlines on the national news um, the week before last. So it was the first, it was what was called a turning point in UK housing provision here in Bristol. Always that pioneering. So we set up that project, which will provide 161 houses. They're about to be built in Southmead alongside community church there. And it'll be the first time to see see what was described as a social responsible capital investment together with the city council and housing association to provide affordable housing. And that's just a, a, a one part of that ongoing story of how do we sense that we can make a difference to our city? How can we bring transformation that touches every area of life? So we bring together next month as the next step following on from Hope um, Bristol 218 on the 5th of May at the city hall, we bring together 200 leaders from across the city. That will be the mayor and the cabinet and many of the leaders in all the spheres of life, the vice chancellor of the university, education spheres, and the churches will facilitate a, a special uh, event there which will have as its title, this banner will be across City Hall. It'll even be on the flag that sighs outside City Hall about building a city of hope and that kind of prophetic word being worked through in the life of the city as to what that really means. And we, part of that challenge has been of 
It's not just uh, how we're seeing that city of hope for the most marginalized, we want to sense the most disadvantaged child having the opportunities in life, what that means, but also for everybody. How do we stir an atmosphere across our city that changes the spiritual climate, that encourages creativity, aspiration, entrepreneurship? And so again, for Woody's, many of you where we have a, a Woody's sort of almost like an IT incubator startup, we bring together, Brad uh, facilitates that every month, maybe up to 30 of those um, entrepreneurs. And uh, uh, so Bristol now is called Mesh Up, and it links with uh, the Shed and some of the other projects. So Bristol now is recognized as the first in Europe um, as a startup capital, as it were, for startup initiatives linked with the universities. And Woody's has been a key part of all that size. It's second in the world now to Silicon Valley in terms of startups. So it's been a key part of that. How do you create a climate across a city that transformational, that changes an atmosphere, that gives a sense that there's, wow, this releases potential in people. And so we want to sense how we see that developed more and more. And as I say, part of that vision for the 5th of May would be that, um, you say it was about 40 years ago, we felt that word about City of Refuge. It took about 20 years for eventually to fully sink through. We did huge projects across the city with the various refugees. I think I've told you about the boat people and when they all came, etc. It took about 20 years for the city eventually to fully recognize that. And so Bristol officially was then declared a city of sanctuary. And there's a plaque in City Hall that has it up there as a city of sanctuary. It's been part of that national recognition. Now, what we're looking for, and on the 5th of May, we hope to be able to initiate that next stage. We will present to the city a certificate on the 5th of May for that recognizing Bristol as a city of hope. We're still negotiating with the city. There's loads of hoops we need to go through, but eventually we hope to see another plaque that will be Bristol City of Hope. Part of those prophetic words that have shaped the history of our city. And they'll be there forever, as it were. So they're, they're the ongoing thing. That's why it takes a lot of, it's all listed building stuff and how you need to get plaques put up. But, but we're on our way there, but that sense of how do you press through to see that kind of prophetic stirring, shaping the very life of a city, transforming transformation and salvation to it. Now, I particularly wanted to encourage that by way of hope because it relates so much to what we're going to share this morning by way of our new series. We start a new series today and the title of the series at first sight might seem the opposite end of, of that. The title of the series is called Grief, Grief. But there's something very special, something very unique about the way Christians handle grief. There's something about how do we see grief that's infused with a sense of hope. So these are the words of scripture, Thessalonians 4, when the first generation of believers were just dying, the first of them had just died, and there was some of them really disappointed because they felt we were all going to be able to see the Lord come. But he says this, I do not want you to grieve as those who have no hope. It's hope that makes the difference, the way we handle grief, the way we handle loss. So over these next three weeks, we're going to do some challenging subjects under the title of grief. In fact, we're calling the overall title Good Grief. In other words, how do we handle grief well? And we're going to look at today, we're going to look at loss. Next week, we're going to look at longing. The week after, it'll be lamentations. And by that, we want to sense today those many ways in which we experience loss. For every one of us here in different ways, in fact, every day of our life, we experience some areas of loss we touch on. How do we handle it? About longings, how are longings not just empty regrets that we have to live the rest of our life? How could longings also have a sense of hope to them, aspiration to them? When it comes to lamentation, the Bible has some amazing sections on lamentation. What does it mean not to be in denial about grief or loss or hurt, but to be honest with God, open with God? So here's Psalm 42 where it says, as deep calls to deep, literally deep within us, when we're having those deep feelings of hurt, of disappointment, of heartache, of loss, how does deep call to deep? How does God relate to all deep calls to deep? In the roar of your waterfalls, when you feel sometimes like wave after wave has come over you of disappointment, of hurt, of heartache, of broken relationships, of financial issues, of, of health fears. What does it mean in the midst of that? And then the psalmist says, just honest before God, why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Why, why so distressed within me? Put your hope in God. Put your, what is it is to put our hope in God in the midst of grief, hurt, heartache, disappointment? What is it even for us as church to develop a theology of suffering as well as a theology of healing? What does it mean to, to grieve well? What does it mean to die well? How do we handle those airs of grief? I mean, last week here at the Sunday morning was a really moving experience where you heard about North Korea and the suffering church. 
And yet we can speak about hope. It's hope that often keeps it alive. I remember seeing one of those news reels once that had been uh, overseas, that earthquake that had left a whole group of people buried underground, deep underground, no contact with above, and the, the rescuers were desperately trying to, to get to them from above, but below the folk didn't even realise what was happening above, and they had limited food, limited air. It was beginning now to reduce, and one by one, they all became so desperate, dying off. Eventually, only one person survived. When they came out, they asked the person, how did you survive? Did you have more food than the other? Did you have better breathing air? No, they said, I had a sense of hope. Hope, you can't eat it, you can't drink it, what, what, but it's hope that can make such a huge difference to our lives, to our world, to our society. In a world where there's so much hopelessness and helplessness, that's how the Bible describes a God, a world without God. Ephesians 2, to be without God and without hope in the world. What is it for us, not just to be carriers of hope, but bringers of hope to a world around us? What would it mean to build a city of hope? A sense in which there was a climate that somehow stirred that sense of hope, even the most marginalized and needy in our world. What about people then, Rob, who are facing real heartache and hurt? How do you handle loss? I want to begin by that, by taking a passage of scripture from Ecclesiastes, this is one of those great wisdom literature of the Bible. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and uh, it speaks about the different seasons of life. And in these different seasons, so Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn or to grieve and a time to dance. How do we hold these in tension? How is it we don't let life is just a yo-yo experience of where I'm up and down. Today, I've got a niece that's just been born. I'm so excited. Tomorrow, my uncle's just died and I'm so disappointed. And life is just a yo-yo roller coaster of emotions. What would it be to find a steadfastness, stability, which is permeated by hope? Whatever situation, whatever season it is, how could you in the same family be handling those? But that's what church is like. Today, we could be announcing today the birth of a new baby this past week. We could also be announcing the death of a dear friend in the same service. How do you hold them together? How do you rejoice with those who rejoice and yet suffer with those who suffer and hold those tensions together? It's hope that makes a difference. We do not grieve as those, and actually speaks about, do not grieve as the rest of mankind who have no hope. There is something distinctive for us as Christians about hope that makes the difference. We're just going to unfold that a little bit together as to what that really means in practice. As for all of us, we're experiencing loss constantly. There are seasons in our life when I often say just the sheer change of life, even, even a, a young family just had a baby born, excited about it all, but then just a few years later, mum is feeling really sad. The loss of a little baby. She's gone to school. I've lost her. You haven't lost her, you've just gained a toddler now. And then that toddler begins to grow up and goes through primary school and gets to the teenage years and I've lost my little girl who was so compliant and now she's this rebellious teen. No, you've just gained a teenager with all new challenges of life and that comes with it, etc. And, uh, and then they grow a bit older and now they're, it's the empty nest syndrome we call it, you know, but they're off the college, etc. Or they're now just getting married and I've lost my daughter or my son. No, you've just gained a son-in-law and a daughter. It's just how we perceive life, whether we measure it purely by a sense of loss or whether life is permeated with a sense of hope. That sense of God's purpose is in our life. And what does that mean? So every day of our life we're feeling loss. It's what we call aging process. And we spend so much money and time trying to fight against it. But we all got it. And then you feel, oh, I've lost my teenage years. I had such energy. I could do such things. Or else I've lost my young adult years when I could attempt. No, you just gained a new experience of life now. Much more experienced, much more sure. Just, just a new stage of life. But you see, when it says God has a plan for us and a purpose for us, is it just a plan for our teenage years? Or is it a plan for every season of life? How do we handle loss? Do we measure it by what's been taken or by what's now new being given? Even the way in which we handle life together as church and even sometimes with regard to healing and suffering, we need to develop a theology of suffering as real as we develop a theology of healing. What does that look like? What does that feel like? 
When I pray for someone, today as I'll pray, I already pray for several folk, but I pray for someone, am I just praying they get better tomorrow, and that's my only prayer, and if they don't get better tomorrow, it's not better, or do I know what it is to be able to pray for a better tomorrow? What does it mean? A sense of hope of God's purposes. There's a better tomorrow. There's always a better tomorrow. The way we handle that sense of future, future purposes. When we come to death itself, and there can almost be a hush when we begin to talk about it. We struggle with it in our society. We kind of have got into a society that finds it hard to handle death. And sometimes even as church, we can struggle, you know. The Bible speaks about people who all their lifetime are in captivity to the fear of death. That's the ultimate enemy. The ultimate dark shadow that can be over all of life, the fear of death. So even then when we're praying for healing, as if the only answer to healing, in fact, that's not the only answer. In fact, when we see healing, and I've seen even some remarkable, even, even seen, uh, even raising the dead in terms of literally seeing God do amazing things, but you know, even for Lazarus, he eventually died. He eventually died. I mean, aging, mortality is part of the way we are. It's part of a fallen world. Ultimately, one day, no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain. But how do we handle it meanwhile? That now and not yet of God's kingdom. What's our attitude to death? Even that fear that sometimes robs us there. I'm conscious speaking here today of some of you who currently are, are, are grieving and I want this to be an encouragement to you rather than some glib comment on that. Because the way we perceive death that will often be the way we handle life and particularly the whole areas of healing. You know, if the Apostle Paul when he felt his number was up, he's about to die, as it were, and, and he's saying to this uh, folks, he says, you know, um, I, I, I'm about to go through my troubles. He says, um, that'll be far better. He said, but I think I better stay a bit longer. Not for me, but for you, because I know you'll struggle without me. But he, I, I, he said, I'm in a quandary. Really. I don't know where to go or to stay. He said, but, you know, to go would be far better, really, but never mind, I'll stay for a while longer. You know, what, what a way, you know, as if death, death had no fear. It wasn't the ultimate cloud. It wasn't the ultimate threat, as it were. Listen to these words of scripture. Oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave. That sense of where sometimes we feel as if there is still that ultimate sting, that fear of death. When I was a little boy growing up, I've told you some of the story I'm sure before, but on Saturday morning I'd often do jobs with my dad. And he'd be doing some DIY, and he'd have a great big metal hammer hanging, banging in nails. I'd have a little plastic one, and my little plastic one was banging every piece of wood around me, you know, kind of thing. And so this particular Saturday morning, it was a summer, I can still remember now, the windows were open, and Dad was banging away with his hammer, as it were, at this job he was doing. And I'm beside him, banging as heavy as I can, my little plastic one doing nothing really, but I felt I was on the job. And, and, and suddenly, this bee flies in through the open window and lands on my dad's hand with a hammer in it as he's about to lift it up to bang. And as he lifts up his hand, this stings him. And there's such a, ouch, and he drops his hammer beside me and I almost jump out of my skin, terrified. But as he dropped the hammer and he flicked his hand back, the bee flew off his hand onto my hand. And I'm there with my little plastic hanger, shh absolutely paralyzed thinking goodness me this is my dad who normally is so brave or anything he just you know as if he's about to die you know the way he shouted so loud for uh, ouch I thought oh yeah, my numbers are about to go as well and, but then my dad said these words I'll never forget he looked across me he said don't worry son I've taken the sting it can't hurt you anymore Jesus has taken the sting out of death the wonder of our Easter, the message that we've been looking at, that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and the wonder of that resurrection life. He's taken the sting out of death. Once I realize that, then it brings to me as a Christian a whole new dimension of hope that somehow changes the way I grieve, the way I handle loss, because ultimately he's overcome. Therefore death will not have the last word takes that fear out of death. Now having said that, it's important also to realize that doesn't mean we don't grieve. Because sometimes there can be this almost denial where some folk feel I'm, I'm a Christian so I've lost someone I really love and uh, really I, I shouldn't be too tearful. I should, when they say to you, how are you doing? Well, fine, thank you. No, that's dishonesty. God wants us to be real. In fact, the greater you've loved someone, the greater the loss you feel. 
Not to feel lost would almost be to undermine the love you felt for them. So therefore the greater you've loved them, the greater you feel the sense of loss and you want to express that loss. And often it is with tears and heartache and, and we need to allow that. You know, sometimes in prayer, and I pray with many, many people at different times who've, who've actually been gushing with tears and sometimes they're saying to me, Rob, between their tears, Rob, forgive me, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm crying. I said, don't worry about crying. That's about being real often, in fact, Often it's your tears that will water these prayers now, these seeds that have been sown. In, uh, and there's something about being real and honest in that. So it's not that we don't grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. There's a different dimension to that grieving. And we need to understand with grief that grief is not just a passing thing, that when the funeral's over, that's the end of it. Often I see folks saying, well, once the funeral's done, then you sort of, no, no, no. For the person concerned, the more you've loved, the greater you'll feel the loss when it's their birthday and no one else necessarily remembers it, when it's your anniversary, when it's your first summer holiday on your own and your first Christmas without them and so another year goes by and every time association and memories you still feel that sense of loss. Often others don't, I was just saying, you know, we had that really traumatic time with the loss of Grant when Grant died and there was an amazing outpouring of care and support from across the church here, it's full for that funeral but I'm not sure that many of you here will have known that it was Grant's birthday this past week. And how many of you would have, I'm not expecting you to remember his birth, but for those close, they would have remembered and felt the anguish and heartache. Because, so loss is something that's often, it's not just momentary in passing, it's a, and we need to recognize loss. It's not that we don't feel loss. It's not that you know, if you're a really strong Christian, you don't feel loss. If you're a really strong Christian, you don't grieve. No, no. It's that you do not grieve without hope. It's that hope that makes the difference. The way we handle hope. You see, God is the God of all comfort. And therefore to know that, even when we speak of the Holy Spirit, one of the great titles the Holy Spirit has given is the divine comforter. Therefore, to be filled with the Holy Spirit in those times of heartache and loss and grief to experience, sometimes I've known folk where it's been their, their lowest ebb spiritually, that primarily felt lowest and most drained, and yet others I've known where it's been the point, where it's been the highest point of their experience of God's grace. And it can vary as we go, but it's just often how much are we open to the work of the Lord. If we're still blaming God for what's happened or not happened, then we struggle with that openness. To that. But he is the divine comforter. The greatest source of comfort in the world is to experience the Holy Spirit ministering God's grace and comfort. He is the God of hope. The verse that's been part of that prophetic word for the city we're using lots, is those amazing words in Romans 15 and verse 13. May the God of hope fill you, fill you with all joy and peace you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What is it to know that hope is not just some self-generated optimism. It's a Holy Spirit deep inside inspiration that stirs us. Helen Keller lived many years ago. Her story is an amazing story. When she was just a baby, they weren't the medical provision there was now, but she fell ill. At the age of two, Helen Keller, because there wasn't the medical provision that could have been treated now, but the results of her illness left her absolutely destitute. She lost her sight and she lost her hearing. Two years old, not yet even fully learned to speak or even to perceive a world around us. It looked like the end of her world. There were many who thought, whatever color of life could she live? We've got no perception of a world around you. You can't hear it, you can't see it. You're just a baby of two, you've not yet experienced it all. What would it mean? Her parents, had an amazing faith in God, that God somehow, and this is where hope, in the midst of such distressing circumstances, and they prayed that God would give her a teacher that could help her to perceive that one. And they found a teacher. She was a remarkable woman, a woman of great faith, but also servant-hearted commitment. She gave her life to help Helen discover a world around her. She taught her Braille, Remember, she couldn't see or hear, so through tactile ways, she helped to teach her to perceive a world around her, explain so many things that she couldn't see or hear, even to perceive the beauty of a creation around her. But she longed to be able to share with her about faith. See, faith, it's like a sixth sense. 
So here is a person who could have lost even, but still has the capacity to believe. How do you open up that capacity? That sense that can perceive a spiritual realm of life. But for this young girl growing up, and it was one Christmas it happened. She was now a young lady. She'd learned Braille and learned an amazing, this teacher and her had an amazing camaraderie of communication. And the teacher felt God say to her, this is the time. And so she explained to her through Braille and through tactile ways, she, the Christmas story. She explained to her the first Christmas story, the birth of Jesus. And then she explained to her that great contained in just one simple verse, the good news of, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. She shared this to her as fully as she could in an amazing way she could. And there was a moment of quiet. Helen couldn't see or hear, but she could whisper. And after a few moments, almost like as if something inside her had been like revelation, she said this. She said, I always knew he was there, but I never knew his name. Helen, when that teacher had shared with the story, the end of it she said, God so loved the world, and his name was Jesus. And as she said that, Helen, in those moments, something happened inside her, something stirred inside her, something was born of God's spirit with inside her, an experience of faith, though blind and, and deaf, yet inwardly experiencing that new birth of God's Holy Spirit, something so real it changed the rest of her life. It brought to her a sense of hope a sense of purpose. But you say, Rob, what could she do? How could she ever? She was the first person ever in the world, the first blind person, to eventually get literally a Bachelor of Arts degree. She studied and eventually did it. She then set around the world and she touched thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives all around the world. People with all sorts of disabilities, many much less than hers, who'd given up hope on life and purpose. And she inspired them to believe that God still could have a purpose for their lives. The end of her life, I won't say she was being interviewed because she couldn't hear, but with a helper and interpreter, she was being interviewed through that, that language of communication through Braille, etc. And the person asked her this question, just towards the end of her life, Helen, what could be worse in life than to have no sight? She could have said no hearing as well. And Helen almost instantly responded as she communicated. She said it would be far worse in life to have sight, but to have no vision or no hope in life. There's something about hope that can be one of the greatest gifts we can give to our children. One of the most important. He is the God of hope. What does it mean, therefore, for us here today? For most of us, I suspect we can see and hear, though for some of us that might become more frail with aging. But, but for some of us here, though we can see and hear, we may have lost hope. There are situations in your life that have become desperate, life-controlling situations. I've just been involved this week with some desperate situations of post-traumatic stress that would be life-threatening. I've been with a young fellow who'd already made the noose to take his life, as it were, to take his own life, and at the end of it, difficult to reason with, it's only in a sense of seeing God break through in those lives. But it's the God of hope who can bring hope in the most desperate situations. So when we think of grief and loss, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. When we come to this table this morning, this is the greatest message of hope. Here is a story of suffering, ultimate suffering and sacrifice. And yet, it's a story of hope. The greatest gift of God, that gift of eternal life. For many of us here this morning, my prayer is that not just that we take communion, but even the opportunity of prayer ministry, whatever circumstance in your life have, have made you downcast, have made you despairing, disappointed, where you've almost given up on God or blamed God for so many things, what would it mean this morning just to open up afresh to him as the God of hope in the midst of that grief and hurt? Let's pray together. Father, come now by your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Spirit of truth, guide us into truth. Divine comforter, draw near. 
You know every one of us. You know our deepest thoughts, our deepest hurts, our deepest heartaches. But we thank you, Lord, that deep Christ to deep in the roar of your waterfall, Lord, where we may feel overwhelmed, even some of us this morning, by situations like waves that have flowed over our life and we've given up. Help us to find hope today, even here at this table, Lord. May it be for some of us a table of hope. In Jesus' name, amen.